Well, good evening. Welcome back on this great Sunday night. First day of August. Hard to believe we're this far into the year. Man, I tell you, it's great to see you here in the sanctuary. Glad to uh, welcome our live streamers tonight. Glad that you're with us on Facebook Live. And also glad to welcome our radio audience at KXOX uh, 96.7, kxox.net. It's uh, wonderful to be able to be here Sunday night at Broadway. Uh, everybody seems to be in a good mood tonight. Everybody nod if you're in a good mood. If you're in a bad mood, shake your head no because you missed your nap or something like that. But uh, it's great to be able to uh, be here in the Lord's house again. Excited about our service tonight as we continue to uh, speak about the battle. The battle that we face with our enemy and, and uh, how we can have victory over the enemy. It's going to be a busy week. Got uh, the Pettel family coming. Um, they'll be traveling in from New Mexico as they have their short furlough from Italy. They are missionaries to Italy, and they'll be here Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. That's a little different for us to have missionaries on Sunday, or rather Wednesday night. Usually we have them on Sundays, but this was all we could work out. So uh, remember, the Pettels will be here on Wednesday night. And uh, also, just a reminder that this may be the first time many of you get to meet them because we took them on in the middle of their term with the uh, missionaries that they were working with in Italy coming off the field and taking a church in uh, New York State. So uh, the Pettels, we have been supporting them for a couple of years now, and we finally get to meet them on Wednesday. So that'll be really, really exciting for that. Uh, next Sunday night, we're going to go over to Southeast Early Childhood, and we're going to do a prayer walk. Uh, just like we did a couple of years ago across the street, and by the way, we're also working on getting across the street to uh, do a prayer walk over there before before school starts. So right after church next Sunday night, we're going to uh, do that prayer walk at uh, Southeast Early Childhood. If you need directions to that, consult your Google, okay? Because listen, every time I go over there to uh, the school, I just happen to drive past and go, oh, there's the school. I just have, I just kind of get there. I don't even know how I get there, but I just go, hey, there it is, and there we are. So uh, church softball starts also in a couple of weeks. The league starts up on Monday night, the 16th, always a fun time to uh, get on out. Newman Park's where we play, and uh, we just have a great time. Church softball practice is tomorrow night at, we determine, 6 o'clock? 6 o'clock tomorrow night uh, over at the softball fields. If uh, you're on the team, show up and uh begin to uh, work out the kinks. That's what we're going to that's what we're going to call it tomorrow night. Work out the kinks, bring plenty of absorbing junior. Do y'all remember absorbing junior? Nobody remembers that stuff, right? Except uh funny funny story about that and then I will uh, uh that's what my dad always used on his arm and you know that spongy thing that's in the top of it, man, that spongy thing would always be all nasty and gnarly and I'm playing golf with this guy a few weeks ago and I, I'm walking, and he's riding, so he's going to give me a ride up one of the hills at the golf course. And I hop in the cart with him and throw my bag right down in the middle, and I look down in the cup holder, and he's got a jar of Absorbing Junior with him. I mean, no, they still made that stuff, but it ought, uh, brought me right back to that same smell, you know, that smell of Absorbing Junior. But anyway, so bring that tomorrow night, icy hot, all that kind of fun stuff. If you need all those leg braces, knee braces, ankle braces, Matt, do you need an ankle brace after your accident two years ago? So make sure you bring that tomorrow night, 6 o'clock. So uh, anyway, we're, we're praying. We're praying that we as a softball team do not end up like every youth event at the ER. But uh, anyway, back to school bash. is uh, Back to school bash is coming up on Wednesday the 18th, 6.30 to 8 o'clock. Of course, those donation barrels are around for... Individual bags of chips, number two pencils, bottled water. We're going to be inviting the whole uh, city to come and be a part of our Back to School Bash on Wednesday, August 18th. I noticed a couple of uh, interests uh, to the Faith Bible Institute. Faith Bible Institute will start back up uh, this month. See Brother Phil for more information. Get a pamphlet about it. And uh, it's always, always a great, great study time. Faith Bible Institute. And we've been talking about and, and reading through a different book of the Bible every month this year. 
some member months we've been reading uh, the same book over and over for the whole month. We did that with Philippians. Just finished Philippians again, and it was amazing how much stuff I remembered because uh, we had just been through that in March, I believe. But uh, this month, we're going to finish the story, all right? Go back to 2 Samuel. We read 1 Samuel two months ago. Read 2 Samuel this month, and I know that there aren't enough chapters to uh, meet the the uh, days in the month, so just kind of do what you did with John and read a little slower as you get to the end or something like that. But uh, anyway, that, that's all coming up. And of course, the 40-foot ice cream Sunday. right? Is it 40 feet or is it 50? Are we going 50 this year or is it just 40? It's 40, 40. 40 feet ice cream Sunday. That is coming up on Promotion Sunday and that is on August 15th. That'll be right after the morning service. Just zip on over there to the Family Center and uh, have some ice cream. We're going to get dessert first uh, before Sunday lunch on the 15th, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Good stuff, man. Can you believe it's August? I mean, really. doesn't feel like August outside, right? But uh, it is August, and uh, we are thankful for the grace of our Lord each and every day, and and thankful that we can be together in the Lord's house. August is going to be a good month. The last Sunday of the month, the fifth Sunday, we're going to have a, always try to do something really special on fifth Sunday. And we're going to hear from our, uh, our kiddos and our kids' ministry on uh, the fifth Sunday and listen to them quote their memory verses and, and do some different things for us. So, uh, Brother Phil and Miss Holly will be in charge of that service on, uh, is it August 30th, I think, is the fifth Sunday. And. And we're going to continue the theme of ice cream through the month of August. And after that Sunday night, uh, fifth Sunday, we're going to have a homemade ice cream fellowship. Can I get an amen? amen. That's what I thought. Might bring a pimento cheese sandwich or something like that, too, to go along with it. But uh, kind of, you know, change the palate between flavors of ice cream that you go with. Uh, ham and cheese, turkey, you know, something like that. Maybe a bag of chips. Maybe there'll be some bags of chips left over from back to school bash, and you know, we, you never know. But uh, anyway, that's coming up later this month. Going to be a lot of fun, and I'm glad you're here tonight to uh, worship the Lord. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Get our service started after our announcements. Lord, we love you and thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for how you care for us each and every day, and thank you so much for bringing us together tonight so that we can uh, worship you again as we sing together, as we. Uh, as we fellowship together, as we hear your word together tonight, I pray that you would bind us together with your love, that you would shine your grace, that most of all, your Holy Spirit would just come down and, and minister to us right where we are, what we need. You know us, each and every one, so well, so individually, so personally, so privately, and you know tonight exactly what we need to hear. So I pray you'd open our hearts and our minds right now to what you you're going to do and how you're going to speak and how you're going to move and we'll thank you and praise you for all you do in Jesus name. Amen. Let's stand together. And let's sing nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's page 195. Words will be on the screen as we sing together. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus, oh. 
the case then the question remains are you washed in the blood of the lamb let's sing it out have you been to jesus for the cleansing power are you washed in the blood of the lamb are you fully trusting in his grace this hour are you washed in the blood of the lamb are you washed in the blood soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you Let's start that over. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's start that over. That's my bad. I, I put a Look, we don't ever sing the third verse, so let's think, sing the third verse. All right, just like me, you're ready to go to the second one. All right, here, when the bridegroom comes. When the bridegroom cometh, will your robes be white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will your soul be ready for the mansion's bright? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? That's good. You know that? Say amen. All right. There's power in the blood. Let's sing it out. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you all evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. as we continue at the cross where I first saw the light Alas and did my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die would he divine 
Because he lives, all that happens is because he lives today. He lives in our hearts. Let's sing it out. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to God. Heal and forgive. One of our favorites to sing. Hope it'll be one of your favorites tonight. Oh. 
blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus can cleanse your deepest sin. Oh, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus can cleanse your deepest sin. You may think you've gone too far you may think there is no power that can wash away your deepest sin there is hope for you my friend jesus died and rose again so that you could know the joy of sins forgive. Oh, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus can cleanse your deepest to cover deep within and everybody thinks your life is in control you can run but you can't hide God sees everything inside the forgiveness waits at the point of Calvary Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, can cleanse your deepest sin. The blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. Beneath that 
So uh, after a song service like that, it's kind of easy and hard at the same time to, uh, to preach. Uh, easy because you're kind of fired up about what we just sang about. Hard because it's going to be kind of hard to match that. You know, uh, wow, I tell you, uh, what, a, what a blessing it is to be able to serve our great God. All right, so tonight, let's find the book of Job in the Old Testament, tucked there neatly, right after Esther and just before Psalms, is the book of Job. What is Job? 41 chapters, I believe. In length, we're going to focus on chapters 1 and 2. 42 chapters in the book of Job. I, was, I always thought it needed to be 40 chapters, but God didn't ask me. Um, 40 is the number of trial, and isn't the uh, book of Job probably the book that describes trials the very best out of maybe all of the Scripture? But uh, we'll be in chapters 1 and chapter 2. We're going to read a lot of Scripture tonight, but uh, give you, by way of introduction, the thought that, you know, life brings all sorts of trials. These trials can be in the form of the enemy's actual temptations or God's testing of our faith. Or I also think it can also be the combination of the two. We can readily admit that neither one, any of these are any fun, but we can also know that gaining victory over temptation and learning through the times of testing will actually bring about much profit in our spiritual lives. And this is likely the reason God revealed these words for James to write, James, his half-brother, in chapter 1 of his epistle, verses 2 through 4, where he wrote, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse or various temptations. That word temptation also means trials, times of testing. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, that means mature and complete, wanting nothing. Now, I don't know about you, but I haven't gotten all the way there yet. Amen? I'm not to the point yet that I rejoice and ha take joy in every trial and test that comes my way. In some ways, I believe our two years in Salt Lake City was a test on the backside of the desert, literally, for us. I believe this with not a doubt in my mind that the Lord sent us there. I don't believe we made a mistake by leaving our ministry in Oklahoma after almost four years and, and going to Salt Lake City and, and uh, assuming the pastor position there. I don't believe it was a mistake. In fact, I tried everything in my power not to go. I mean, do you, have you ever set, because we went through an interview process and everything, have you ever went into a job interview and told your potential employer everything you knew they didn't want to hear so you didn't get the job? I mean, that's kind of what I did. I, I really took the weekend that I went by myself and preached and met with the pulpit committee, I took it 
seriously, but not very seriously. Because I'll be honest with you, I didn't want to go. I mean, I liked Oklahoma. I was telling Holly this past week in the office, I, if I have my personal preference, we'd still be in Oklahoma. I know that's shocking. But I loved our people and our church and the ministry that the Lord was establishing there in northeastern Oklahoma, outside of Tulsa and Claremore with us. I love those people. And, and I had already staked a claim to that city and that area in Jesus' name that we were going to do something great. And, and really, I had all every plan for that to be our entire ministry was right there in northeastern Oklahoma. The only thing I dreaded was every year the taxes. The taxes were awful in Oklahoma, but that's another story entirely. I mean, I loved it there. So when we got the call that, that uh, a pastor had recommended us there, and, and uh, I, they sent me a questionnaire. It was like six questions, but they were like essay questions. I answered them all in one sentence. One question I answered in one word. And I remember putting that self-addressed stamped envelope in the mail after about keeping it on my desk for over a month. And I remember praying. Oh, by the way, the only reason I really filled it out was because I knew my pastor friend would eventually ask me what happened, you know, with the church. How did, you know, did you get through the interview process? What do you think? And, and I knew he would have ultimately ask him because I'd see him again ultimately at a meeting and I'd either have to lie to him or I'd have to tell him that, you know, I just didn't send anything to the, back to the church. So while I went to the mailbox, I rolled down the window and I looked at this envelope and I said, Lord, please let them already have called a pastor. And I put it in the mail. Three days later, I get a phone call from the head of the pulpit committee. And then just a matter of a few weeks later, we were heading west, way west, further west than I had ever wanted to be. Beautiful country, different settings, different surroundings, no family, the only grandkids, and they weren't very big. And it was a test. We, many people, when I tell them that I've pastored in Sandy, which is a southern suburb of Salt Lake City, Utah, say, wow, I bet that was hard. And it was. But it was not hard in the ways that you might think it was hard. It was hard because the people in that church were at odds with everything. And the devil was fighting so hard against that church that I didn't even have time to fight with the Mormons. I mean, that's just the honest truth. I, I mean, and really, to be honest with you, every, every real staunch Mormon that I met in the Salt Lake Valley was nicer to me than some of my own church people were to me and to us. And so those two years, and I'm not at all whining about it, because what it did for us is it really very still young in our ministry and certainly young in the, in the pastor position, it taught us that we better know who we are in the Lord and we better know that we are leaning completely and totally on Him. Because I'll be honest with you, in two years, I didn't know that I could trust anybody in that church except for my youth pastor. And I had to trust him, and he had to trust me because we were kind of there on an island. And it was hard. Boy, was I ever so thankful that the Lord only had us there for 24 months and not 40 years like Moses. 24 months was still an awful long time for us. We came back with... Uh, you know, a third child still in the womb, about to be a Texan, thank the Lord. And uh, thankfully, our third child is no nothing but Texas. And 
For the most part, our other two kids don't remember a whole lot about Utah because they were still pretty small, especially Andrew. God, I think, had a hand of protection on him, although he did have a very interesting kindergarten experience. And uh, one of these days, I'll let him share some of that story about his kindergarten graduation with you. If not, maybe we'll pull out some old video. Really, really good blackmail material, for sure. But, uh, but man, I'm telling you, there were just... uh, days, weeks, that the only solace I could find in Salt Lake City was to open the blinds to my window in my office and look at the mountains, which we were very blessed with a great view there. There was an 11,000 foot granite peak right out my window that just stood majestically overlooking me and there were many days that I would look up at that mountain and I would see God and I would just go God you're the only one who can get us through this and please please help us because I'm struggling my wife is struggling so badly we are trying to find an identity here and God you're just not showing us any light at the end of the tunnel after we had been there for a year and a month on Christmas day We just had a family over to our house. We didn't get to go home for Christmas that year. And so we had had a family over for lunch. We had shared our little, about the most Charlie Brown Christmas we've ever had together in in, uh, the parsonage. And and I'm walking the trash out to the dumpster across the parking lot because we lived in the parsonage right on the church property. And, And I'm walking the trash out and it's a pretty decent little walk. Snowflakes are coming down. It's really a beautiful Hallmark setting, but in my mind, I was hurting so bad in my heart. I was hurting so bad. I was, it was Christmas, and I was missing my family, and here we were in the middle of nowhere, and I hate cold weather. And as I'm putting that trash in that dumpster, I prayed this prayer, God, you have got to give me a burden For my Jerusalem, these Mormon people, or you have got to move us. One of those two things has got to happen. Because this test, this trial, is killing me. There were many days that I sat in my office, ready to write the resignation letter, and try to figure out how to get back to Texas, and try to figure out how to get a real job Because my kids have told me forever that I don't have a real job. I know what it's like, and you do as well, to go through a test from the Lord, but also to have the enemy jump into the middle of that test and begin to throw out all sorts of temptations. Life is tough. Life is full of trials. No doubt, again, you have experienced seasons of testing. And we can all admit to being tempted by the enemy during those seasons of testing. But let me say this, sometimes, if not many times, the enemy's influence is noticed in a big way when we're in the middle of that test of our faith. And he's going to seek to get us to turn our back on God and His manner of treating us. Because after all, isn't the enemy going to come to us and going to say, look what God's doing to you. Look what God is doing to you. How could you love Him? How could you trust Him in the midst of all of that? You see, the battle is in many, many different realms in our lives. There's the battlefield of David and Goliath, but boy, there is the battle of the mind where we are fighting and struggling with many, many giants mentally. With these things in mind, let's examine Job. And I think it is helpful. It's always been very helpful to me to study this book in this light. What God allowed to happen in his life. And we're also going to look at how he reacted and how the enemy attempted to derail his faith. Okay, so let's read, again, a number of verses here in Job 1 because we need to be reminded about what's happening. Job 1 1 says, 
There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, means he was mature in his faith. Upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil, shunned, stiff-armed evil as we are told to do. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. Man, back in those days, ten kids was the sign of huge blessing. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she-asses or donkeys, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. So if he's the greatest man, that means everybody knew it. His sons went, and they feasted in their houses every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And so it was. When the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, and thus Job did continually. This was a godly man, and he was concerned about his family also following in his footsteps and being godly sons and daughters." But then is, this is where it really gets interesting. Verse 6. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Okay, the term sons of God can be identified as the spiritual realm that we do not see. The sons of God are the created angelic beings, some of them which have now turned evil, following the devil, thus being kicked out of heaven. Remember? Okay, so that's who the sons of God are. Now, look again at this very closely. There was a day when these created spiritual beings of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan, also a created spiritual being, came also among them. So, if they had to come before the Lord, who was in charge of them? God was. Why? Because He's their creator. And they are under Him. Again, being reminded that Satan can only have the power that God gives him. Do you understand that? Do you see that pretty clearly? Okay, so this is where it, to me, gets really kind of, what? I mean, do you ever read some of the Bible and go, did I just read that right? This is one of those verses. The Lord said to Satan, okay, whence comest thou? Then Satan answered, I've come from going to and fro in the earth, from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said to Satan, okay, so what Satan is doing in verse 7, he's been going all around the world, and he's been been looking for who he's going to go torment and test and put some real hardship on. The Lord said to Satan in verse 8, have you considered my servant Job? What? What? I mean, if Job was present in this conversation, don't you think Job would have been going, squeeze me? What what are you talking about? Did I just hear that right? But he wasn't present. Job's just bebopping around in earth. I mean, he's just going through the daily duties, right? He has no idea what's about to happen. Just like you and I don't know what's about to happen tomorrow, right? We have no idea. But here's this conversation going on in heaven. Hast thou considered my servant Job? There's none like him on earth, perfect and upright, mature and upright, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? You put a hedge of protection around him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side. Haven't you done that? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance has increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. The Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. 
Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord, and guess where he went? Right to Job. Right to Job. He's got, a, he's got free reign now. Almost. There was a day then, in verse 13, when, the sons and, uh, when his sons and daughters, Job's sons and daughters, were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Well, there goes some prophet. While he was yet speaking, there came an, another and said, the fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep, the servants, and, and the servants, and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now there goes some more prophet. While he was yet speaking, there came in another. The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. I only am escaped to tell you about it. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I only am escaped to tell you about it. Wow! What God allowed in Job's life is... Uh, Startling, isn't it? Um, so don't ever come to me and say, Pastor, I've really had a bad day after reading that. Because I don't think you can get much worse a day than that. Until you get to chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Boy, let's just not have that day. You know, can we, can we skip that day? You know? And Satan, of course, came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Why? Because the Lord is in charge of him. And the Lord said to Satan, From whence comest thou? Satan again answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. What's he trying to do? Torment, test, tempt. That's what he's doing. That's what he is relegated to do after his fall. The Lord said to the Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? Really? I mean, again, Job has no idea this is going on again in heaven. He's just lost all of his pride. He's lost all of his sons. He has buried his sons and daughters. And now he's got to start all over in the business. And he has no idea what now is coming. Verse 3. Have you considered Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. See, the wording there tells us that the devil didn't do anything that God didn't allow him to do. Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life, but put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face, Satan says to God. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. In other words, you cannot kill him. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took him a potsherd or a piece of pottery to scrape himself with all. And he sat down in the ashes. Yowza. So just about the time you think it couldn't get any worse. What God allowed got worse. Some of us are just completely blown away with what we just read and commented on, right? You're just like going, really? I did not, I had no idea. Some of you have read it and you're still just kind of like, 
I just can't believe that happened. It is difficult to grasp. But, just as we talked about in the earlier message, God is in charge. He is. This may not make any sense to us, but it does to God. So, for God to allow all these catastrophic events to happen in the life of Job, surely he was angry at him, right? And yet, we don't read that in there anywhere, do we? Nowhere do we read that God was angry at Job. I mean, if you're like me, when I get to heaven, I'm finding Job's mansion, and I'm going to go give that guy a hug. I mean, I think that guy needs a hug. He certainly needed it that day, except, yuck. Wow. Yet, here's what we know from further Scripture. In the Scripture, the Word, you know, is eternal, everlasting. Remember what we read this morning from 1 Corinthians 10, 13? That God is faithful, and He will never allow us to be tempted above that which we are able. So when the Bible says that Job was a mature, complete Christian, it's our terminology, he must have really been a mature Christian to be able to handle what God allowed to come on his life. You agree? I mean, those aren't just words on a page. That's what Job lived out. Again, when the Bible says that He will never allow us to be tempted above that which we are able, we also have to know that we handle it by faith. So Job's faith was strong. And it needed to be for what he was going through. Agreed? This is torturous to lose your well-being, your family, and your health all in a matter of just a little short space of time. That's tough. It's amazing, isn't it? But it's even more amazing to me how Job reacted. Look back in chapter 1 and verse 20. Then Job arose after his finances were ripped from his bank and after his family was ripped from his life that he obviously loved very much. He arose and rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down on the ground, and cursed God. That's not what it says, is it? He worshipped. That means he presented himself humbly before God. Amazing. Then he said, naked I came out of my mother's womb, naked shall I return. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, this what? This test and these temptations, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. He didn't ever look up at God and say, why me? Boy, I know I like to cry that out from time to time when I'm in a test. He didn't look up at God and say, why do I even care about you if you're going to allow this to happen to me? He didn't do any of that. He worshipped. He admitted that, hey, Lord gave it. Lord can take it away. It's all His. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Bible said he didn't sin or charge God foolishly. 
Look down in chapter 2, verse 9. After his health has been taken, then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Boy, that was a real help meet. But Job said to her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this, did not Job sin with his lips? What Job does and says tells us that he really is a committed child of God. He's in it thick and thin, no matter what. Do you believe you could react in this manner? I mean, really. I've tried to put myself in Job's shoes on many occasions. And I just don't know if I could or not. Truth of the matter is, guess who knows what we can handle? And guess what? If you look at it with this perspective, shame on us that we couldn't handle what Job handled with the integrity and uprightness and holiness that he handled this test. Ever think about it that way? We are too mixed up feeling sorry for Job. When his relationship with God was right, he was heading toward an ultimate healing and eternity with God through his faith and belief in him. We should actually probably be feeling sorry for us that our faith and our belief in God is not that strong. Therefore, we're a little mixed up in the world where Job, even though he was highly blessed, still blessed the Lord in the hardship. In the face of troubles and trials in this life, how do we usually react? See, this is a man who was standing on the principles of God's Word. He knew God's character and he was trusting in Him completely even though he was not privy to the information that the Bible tells us about of the meeting at the throne of God with what God allowed to happen to his life. You see, I believe that he knew God's word enough that he would not allow him to be tempted or tested above that which he was able to bear. And I believe he believed that by faith that God had presented Himself in such a manner to him that he believed that. But let's make no mistake at all, in this, Job was in a battle, wasn't he? I mean, he was in a real battle. He was certainly grieving over his family's law, or the loss of his family, his sons and his daughters, they loved very much. He was certainly like wondering, okay, well, what are we going to eat tomorrow since we just lost everything? And now he was like, huh. I don't even know how I'm going to pay my doctor bills for this. So I'm just going to sit out on the street and scrape myself. I mean, he's in a battle. That's where the enemy really comes in and attempts to get his attention. And you've already read it. It's in verse 9. The enemy works through his wife. His wife just says, hey... Job, why don't you just curse God and die? And the next chapters, all the way up until 40, 39, his friends come and they also, the enemy works through them. Why don't you, what have you done, what have you sinned to cause all this to come upon you? Now, Job has his weak moments, do not get me wrong. Job has his times where he really whines. But give the guy a break. You'd whine too. If you'd just been through all this. I mean, he opens his mouth in chapter 3, verse 1, and cursed his day. I mean, his, he says, the day I was born was a cursed day. If I knew all this. I mean, so he has his weak moments. Don't get me wrong. The enemy is really, though, attempting him, attempting to get him to curse God to leave his face, to let this test be the end of him. 
rather than the refiner of him. God allowed the enemy almost free reign on Job. God allowed him to take away most of his family, his possessions, and now his health. And we know the enemy is staying right in character because John 10.10 tells us that he is out to steal, to kill, and to destroy us. All of his attempts on Job were just to get him to curse God, but he couldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. Now the enemy's even using his wife to persuade him. Why don't Job you just, man, just get it over with? But he didn't. He wouldn't. What a character Job is. You see, Job was not just serving God for the blessings. That's important to note. He was serving God because he believed with all his heart that he was God. Do you remember Hebrews eleven six? 6? For without faith we cannot, or it is impossible to please God. For we must believe that he is God. I mean, that's Hebrews eleven six 6 in essence. Without faith it's impossible to believe God. We must believe that he is God. And Job did. And if God was God, then he knew, God knew what was best for him. For that reason, Job followed God by faith. His faith led him to know that what God allowed in his life was going to ultimately be for his good. Now, did he know that at this present time? Did he know what was going to happen at the end of the book? Did he know the blessings? Did he know the long life? Did he know that he was going to have more kids? Did he know that his God was going to allow his wife to go through childbirth more times? No. He didn't know all that at this particular time. But what he did know is he said, I know God's faithful. Somehow, some way, this is going to be okay. So the battles we face certainly might not be as severe, thankfully. In fact, not many have ever gone through what Job did as this trial of his faith. But in our trials, do we react in the manner Job did? Or do we give in to the enemy's temptation to blame God, turning our back on Him, blaming Him for what has happened? By the end of this story, i got to admit to you, by the end of reading Job, I'm usually really ashamed of my faith. I am. I'm just ashamed. Why? Why? Because the tests and trials that I go through are nothing compared to what Job went through. As God knew what his big faith could handle. And he handled it. He got through it. And I believe, you know, not many of us have talked to God like Job got to talk to God by the end of the book. And God proved just how faithful he was to Job by the end. So I hope that we'll use this week to deeply consider our faith, what God allows to test us, and how we are handling those tests and trials. And to be acutely aware of how the enemy is tempting us to go against God in and through those tests. Will you do that with me? Because just like a few weeks ago, I'm still really working on my tongue. And I ask you to start thinking about those idle words that we say, those useless words. Hopefully, from our Sunday night message this week, we can take And think about the tests and the trials that we'll go through this week. And know that they are for our good. They're working together. God's plan. God's allowing them. And to make sure that we are stiff-arming the devil. The enemy's attacks within those tests to try to get us to go against God and step away from our faith. Let's commit to doing that this week.
Father, help us in that commitment. Help us as we leave and as we enter into this week, not knowing what tomorrow has, because none of us do but you do. And so, Lord, I just pray that we would walk by faith, step by step, through each test and each trial, and that we would remain faithful day by day, thinking about how that you have a good work that you are doing in our lives. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.